you can pre-order Modern Horizons 3 using my link in the description. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and in this video I'm continuing with my Modern Horizons 3 set review. I've already covered all the non-mono green cards in the set, so in this video I'll be looking at those remaining green cards. For each of these cards I'll discuss how I think they'll perform in limited, that means draft and sealed, and I'll punctuate each evaluation with a letter grade. If you're new to my set reviews and unsure of what my letter grades mean, you can find a guide in the description for this video. There are some things to keep in mind as I review these cards. First, because we're only talking about draft and sealed, I'm only going to be talking about cards that can be found in play boosters. Furthermore, I'm only looking at cards from the main set in this video. Play boosters in this set do have a bonus sheet, and I'll be talking about those cards in the next video. Also, these are my evaluations of these cards before playing with them, since the goal is to have this ready for you in time for the pre-release, and that means I'll be wrong about some stuff, but as the format comes into focus, I'll be doing videos where I discuss how things have turned out. Lastly, I want to let you know that there is a set review related perk for being a channel member. You get a spreadsheet with all of my grades once a set review is complete. If that interests you, check out the description where you can find out how to support the channel using one of those methods. All right, let's look at the green cards in Modern Horizons 3. First up, we've got Basking Brood Scale, which for one generic and a green is a 2 2 Eldrazi Lizard at common. It's got Devoid, means it's colorless. And for one generic and a green, it can adapt one. If this creature has no plus and plus one counters on it, put a plus and plus one counter on it. And when one or more plus and plus one counters are put on the Brood Scale, you may create a 0 1 colorless Eldrazi spawn creature token with Sacrifice this creature, add green. So Basking Rootwalla is an Eldrazi now, and he's still pretty good. You can drop it on turn two and then threaten to adapt it later. And if you draw it in the later game, you can pay four total for it to just get all the value all at once. Plus and plus one counters are a big theme in green, and adapting isn't the only way to get that token as a result. This looks like a really good common, giving it a B minus. Next, it's Birthing Ritual, which for one generic and a green is a mythic rare enchantment. At the beginning of your instep, if you control a creature, look at the top seven cards of your library. Then you may sacrifice a creature. If you do, you may put a creature card with mana value X or less from among those cards onto the battlefield, where X is one plus a sacrificed creature's mana value. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This is a cool take on Birthing Pod, but not good and limited. It's just too hard to line up this type of effect to actually do something. And even when it does something, giving up something on board for something that costs one more mana isn't exactly insane. It's an F. Next up, it's Collective Resistance, which for one generic and a green is an uncommon instant with Escalate for a green. You can pay this cost for each mode chosen beyond the first, and it says choose one or more. Destroy target artifact, destroy target enchantment. Target creature gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. There are a lot of enchantments and artifacts in this set, and the indestructible hexproof mode is pretty nice too. Sometimes you can do all three of these at once, which will be an absolute beating. Blank a removal spell and destroy two permanents. Your opponent isn't coming back from that. Now, you're not going to do that often, but that's the ceiling here, and the floor is a solid card. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Colossal Dread Mask, which for four generic and two green is a common artifact equipment with living weapon. That means when it enters the battlefield, you create a 0-0 black Phyrexian germ creature token and attach this to it. The equipped creature gets plus six, plus six, and has trample, and you can equip it for three generic and two green. You know, in a set filled with references to various meta magic things, they had to have a Colossal Dread Maw reference, and I actually think it's a pretty good card. A six mana, six, six trampler is fine, and even if your opponent deals with the token, you have an equipment that can make anything into a huge threat. Sure, it's a little clunky to move around, but by the late game, you're more than willing to spend mana on something like this. Having one of these seems like a good idea in mini green decks. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Eladomri Korvek Doll, which for one generic and two green is a 3-3 Elf Warrior at Mythic Rare. You can look at the top card of your library anytime. You can cast creature spells from the top of your library, and you can pay one green and tap it and tap two untapped creatures you control to reveal a card from your hand or the top card of your library. If you reveal a creature card this way, put it on the battlefield, activate only during your turn. This looks great. If Eladomri only had those first two lines of text, it would be a great card. But he even comes with the ability to put creatures from your library onto the battlefield, which is good not only because you get a card from your library on the battlefield, but also because it increases your chances of dropping two cards from the top of your library in a turn because you only spent one mana for one of them. You can also put creatures into play from your hand, but that is far less powerful. Now, you're not always going to have stuff on the top that you can get value from, but if you have like 16 plus creatures, Eladomri is effectively going to draw you cards, and especially when left unchecked. I think it's a bomb, giving it an A-. 
Next up, it's Eldrazi Repurposer, which for two generic and a green is a 3-3 Eldrazi drone at common with Devoid. When you cast this spell and when it dies, create a 0-1 colorless Eldrazi spawn creature token. So you pay three mana for a 3-3 and two 0-1s that can ramp your mana. You don't get all four bodies at once, but that's still a really good deal, giving it a C+. Next, it's Evolution Witness, which for two generic and a green is a 2-1 Elf Shaman Mutant at common. It's got Adapt 2 for one generic and a green. And when one or more plus and plus one counters are put on it, you return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. This is a nice take on Eternal Witness. Sure, it'd be better if it grabbed you something from the yard when it entered the battlefield, but adapting and getting a card back is nice too. And it even has the potential to do it more than once if you have some other ways to put counters on it, giving it a C+. Next, it's Fanatic of Ronus, which for one generic and a green is a 1-4 Snake Druid at rare. It can tap for green, and it has Ferocious, tap, add 4 green. Activate only if you control a creature with power 4 or greater, and it has Eternalize for 2 generic and 2 green, which means you exile it from your graveyard and create a token that's a copy of it, except it's a 4-4 Black Zombie Snake Druid with no mana cost, Eternalize only as a sorcery. A 2-mana 1-4 that can tap for green is already pretty close to a B-, and this has so much upside. Tapping for four green can be pretty sweet, although sometimes it might be a little win more since you've already got a big creature in play if you have access to that ability, but it's Eternalize that really makes this nuts. It comes back from the graveyard as a 4-4 for only four mana, and that potentially gives you a two for one right there. And obviously once it's an Eternal, it can tap for four green because it has more than four power. I think the efficiency and value here is enough to make this a bomb, giving it an A-. minus. Next, it's Fangs of Colonia, which for one generic and a green is an uncommon sorcery. Put a plus and plus one counter on target creature you control, then double the number of plus and plus one counters in each creature that had a plus one plus one counter put on it this way, and it has overload for four generic and two green. You can cast this for its overload cost if you do change target in its text to each. The base form of this card isn't very good, even in a set with a plus and plus one counter theme. You usually pay two mana for two counters, and yeah, sometimes more, but it's just a buff spell and nothing else, and at sorcery speed, that's just not always worth a card. It gets interesting with Overload, where it can potentially offer a huge buff to your whole board, but we've seen similar cards that interact with counters and double them on the whole board before, and they just haven't performed that well when they're this expensive. It just needs too much setup to pull off that big turn, and even when you do pull it off, it isn't always going to be meaningful. I think it's a D+. Next, it's Flare of Cultivation, which for one generic and two green is a rare sorcery. You can sacrifice a non-token green creature rather than pay the spell's mana cost. Search your library for up to two basic land cards, reveal those cards, put one onto the battlefield tapped, and the other into your hand, then shuffle. A harder to cast Kodama's Reach is a pretty solid baseline. It can really fix and ramp your mana in a big way. Now, it doesn't add to the board, which can be a liability these days, but I think lots of green decks will be happy to use this. Casting it for free sometimes is nice too, but I feel like you do that the least often with this card from the Flare Cycle. After all, you're already not adding to the board, so subtracting from it too seems like a big risk, and in the later game, you're not going to be desperate to cast this for free or anything either, I'm giving it a C+. Next, it's Foul Strike, which for one generic and a green is a common instant. Destroy target creature with flying, and it has reinforced two. That means you can pay two generic and a green and discard it to put two plus and plus one counters on target creature. Mini decks have a few targets for this, and when they don't, it's a mediocre combat trick. Neither card is individually something that would make the cut in the main deck, but put them both together and you don't feel too bad about this. I'm giving it a C-. Next, it's Gift of the Viper, which for one green mana is a common instant. Put a plus and plus one counter or reach counter and a death touch counter on target creature, untap it. One mana tricks usually perform pretty well, but I don't like this one that much. None of what this does protects the creature from removal in most cases. And these days, the best tricks tend to offer significant protection from removal in addition to also being good in combat. This one's mostly only good in combat, and the whole ambush idea here is a huge risk because your opponent is more likely to two for one you if you try to pull this off during your turn. Furthermore, plus one plus one just isn't that big of a boost, so there are a lot of scenarios where you give this boost to one of your creatures and it still dies in combat. Maybe you kill your opponent's thing, but that means you just two for one yourself. So overall, it's not that good in combat and it's also not that good against removal, so I think it's a C minus. Next, it's Horrific Assault, which for one green mana is a common sorcery. Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. If you control an Eldrazi, you gain three life. A one mana Rabid Bite is already excellent, and sometimes you're going to gain three while removing an opposing creature, and it's probably more often than sometimes. Green has a bunch of Eldrazi and Eldrazi tokens. You're going to gain three with this pretty often. As usual, 
You do need to make sure your opponent can't interact before you try to use this, but by costing one mana, finding that window is a lot easier. Killing something and gaining life all at the same time is a great way to pull ahead in a game, especially when it's only one mana. I'm giving this a B. Next, it's the Hunger Tide Rises, which for two generic and a green is an uncommon enchantment saga. Chapters 1 through 3 make a black and green insect creature token. Chapter 4 says, Sacrifice any number of creatures, search your library and or graveyard for a creature card with mana value less than or equal to the number of creatures sacrificed this way and put it on the battlefield. If you search your library this way, shuffle. Chapters 1 through 3 are pretty good value for 3 mana, so the fact that you have a chapter 4 that lets you cash in bodies to tutor up a creature directly into play is nice. You're not always going to want to take advantage of chapter 4, mind you. It's sometimes just not a good idea to give up a bunch of bodies for one body, but there are certainly times where you will. Most of the value comes from just making tokens, though. I'm giving this a C+. Next, it's Hydra Trainer, which for one generic and a green is a 1-1 human warrior at uncommon. You may exert it as it attacks. When you do, target creature gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of counters on permanence you control. An exerted creature won't untap during your next untap step, and it has adapt 2 for 2 generic and a green. A 2 mana 1 1 is real bad, but this can become a 3 3 on the next turn and potentially attack as a 6 6 all on its own. That's a pretty big jump from a 2 mana 1 1. And of course, the exert effect can also be used to buff something else. And the later you go in the game in a deck that has a bunch of plus 1 plus 1 counters, the bigger this buff is going to be, and it is a pretty serious one. The only knock on this card really is that it starts out so inefficiently, but it becomes really efficient before too long, giving it a B minus. Next up, it's Lion Umbra, which for two green mana is an uncommon enchantment aura. It can only enchant a modified creature, and equipment auras, its controller controls and counters are modifications. Enchanted creature gets plus three plus three and has vigilance and reach, and this has Umbra armor, which means if the enchanted creature would be destroyed, you remove all damage from it and destroy this aura instead. This is kind of a new spin on Daybreak Coronet, which is kind of fun. Modified creatures are easier than usual to have in this set. We've already seen in this video that there are plus one plus one counters everywhere. But even with that in mind, there will be times where you just can't put this on anything, and that is a nightmare. Now, when you can put it on something, you make it into a huge threat that is also protected from removal thanks to Umbra armor. Of course, if they do eventually have something that can destroy the creature, getting rid of Lion Umbra at instant speed might just be enough for them to kill your creature in combat anyway, because it is going to be a big portion of what's making your creature good. But this still looks like it has a home to me. It probably needs a build around grade because if you're in a green deck that isn't going really hard on counters, it's probably pretty bad, like a D minus. But if you've gotten there, it's probably a C plus. Next, it's Malevolent Rumble, which for one generic and a green is a common sorcery. Reveal the top four cards of your library. You may put a permanent card from among them into your hand, put the rest into your graveyard, create a 0-1 colorless Eldrazi spawn creature token with, sacrifice this creature, add colorless. This is a solid card selection card that also loads your graveyard, adds to the board, and potentially ramps your mana. If the graveyard was a bigger theme in green in this set, this card could be really good, but it's not a huge theme for green, and you don't want too many cards that barely impact the board, but this is one you'll find room for reasonably often. I'm giving it a C. Next, it's Monstrous Vortex, which for three generic and a green is an uncommon enchantment. Whenever you cast a creature spell with power five or greater, discover X, where X is that spell's mana value. When you exile cards from the top of your library, tell you exile a non-land card with that mana value or less, cast it without paying its mana cost or put it into your hand, put the rest on the bottom in a random order. So this does stone nothing on its own, and that's never a good thing. But if you can untap and then play a high power creature, you could get something going. And it can actually trigger more than once a turn, so if you hit another high power creature, you can discover again. That's the exciting potential this card has, but the fact remains that it requires you to do nothing for a turn in most cases, and 5 power is a really, really high threshold for you to hit. There's a reason in most sets they like to look at 4 power, because that's a lot easier to get than 5. So you're just not going to have, even in this set, that many cards that trigger this. So the cost of playing it and not adding to the board at all the turn before is something you really have to find a way to make up for, and it's just not going to do it often enough. I think it's a D. Next up, it's Nightshade Dryad, which for one generic and a green is a 1-2 Dryad at common. It's got Death Touch, it can tap for colorless, and it can tap for one mana of any color. I like this. It can produce much-needed colorless mana for the many cards in the set that care about that, and the ability to produce mana of any color is awesome too. It's about as flexible a mana source as you can have in this set. One thing I also like is that oftentimes a mana dork is a pretty bad draw in the late game, but this one's still relevant on most boards because of death touch. This looks like a nice common 
giving it a B minus. Next up, it's Nyxborn Hydra, which for an X and a green is a 0-1 enchantment creature Hydra at common. It's got Bestow X and 2 green, and that means if you cast it for its Bestow cost, it's an aura spell with enchant creature. It becomes a creature again if it's not attached. It's got Reach and Trample. It enters the battlefield with X plus and plus 1 counters on it, and the enchanted creature gets plus 1 plus 1 for each plus and plus 1 counter on Nyxborn Hydra and has Reach and Trample. So this will basically never feel super efficient, but it is the kind of thing that scales all game long and can make a big impact on a given turn. Like if it's late and you have a bunch of mana and you have a good attack, or maybe you don't have a good attack, then you can bestow this onto something and suddenly you have one. It can give you lethal damage out of nowhere. It's clunky and it's expensive, but it can do it. And you can also just play it out as a creature to begin with, which still isn't that efficient, but it's not a disaster either. As is the case with most bestow things, the way to get the best value out of them is to put them on a creature first, because then if that creature ever dies, you still get to hold on to your creature. But yeah, it's inefficient, but the fact it scales all game long in a color like green that looks like it's good at producing mana makes it fine. I'm giving it a C. Next, it's Path of Annihilation, which for three generic and a green is an uncommon enchantment with Devoid. When it enters the battlefield, you create two zero one one colorless Eldrazi spawn creature tokens. Eldrazi you control have tap, add one mana of any color. Whenever you cast a creature spell with mana value seven or greater, you gain four life. So the idea here is that this offers you some serious ramp and fixing and then makes up for not adding to the board in a big way by gaining you life later because you ramp into a big ol' Eldrazi ahead of schedule. This can definitely get that done, potentially on the very next turn, and getting two bodies does mean that after you cast this, you probably don't lose right away, even if you're behind. I think it looks pretty good. I'm giving it a C+. Next up, it's Primal Prayers, which for two generic and two green is a rare enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you get two energy. You may cast creature spells with mana value three or less by paying an energy rather than paying their mana costs. If you cast a spell this way, you may cast it as though it had flash. An energy-based Aluren is pretty interesting, but like pretty much all of these energy-based reserve list cards in this set, it doesn't look good in Limited. Getting creatures from your hand into play for free is surprisingly hard to take advantage of in Limited, even without a restriction like Primal Prayers has. Even if it's doing what it's supposed to do, Primal Prayers doesn't actually give you a card worth of value in most cases. And that's a huge liability in Limited. It's an F. Next up, it's Propagator Drone, which for one generic and a green is a 2-2 Eldrazi Drone at Uncommon. It's got Devoid. Creature tokens you control have Evolve, and that means they have whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it has greater power or toughness than this token, put a plus and plus one counter on that token. And you can pay three generic and a green to make a 0-1 Colorless Eldrazi spawn creature token with, sacrifice this creature, add Colorless. A 2-mana two 2-2 two two that can spit out a 0-1 for four mana is a card you pretty much always play, and this giving Evolve to your stuff is no joke. 0-1 spawns are going to grow very easily, and you're likely to have other 0-1s around in green, not just the ones the Propagator generates. It also works with other tokens. So you've got like a really good baseline here, and then the potential for this to just really grow your board like crazy. I'm giving this a B. Next up, it's Signature Slam, which for two generic and a green is an uncommon instant. It says, put a plus and plus one counter on target creature you control. Then each modified creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. Most of the time, the fact your other modified creatures do damage isn't going to make a huge difference, but it does mean that this isn't quite as risky as some other bite effects, since if they kill only one thing, their creature might still be dead, thanks to your other modified creatures. It is kind of funny, I think the one green mana bite effect that's a sorcery is better than this, just because it's so crazy efficient, but this is still premium removal. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Six, which for two generic and a green is a 2-4 Legendary Tree Folk at rare. It's got Reach. When it attacks, you mill three cards, and you can put a land from among them into your hand. As long as it's your turn, non-land permanent cards in your graveyard have Retrace. You may cast permanent cards from your graveyard by discarding a land card in addition to paying their other costs. A three mana 2-4 with Reach is a solid starting point, and Six has great abilities beyond that. The attack trigger is going to draw you a card and load the yard a lot, and then you can use the land Six gets you to retrace the things you mill. The great thing is, Six can fuel itself, but even if you get it late, there's a good chance you can take advantage of retrace too. If you're playing with Six in your deck and you've got a bunch of lands in play and you're in top deck mode, just hold on to all your lands, because if you draw six, you're suddenly going to be able to cast stuff, which is pretty awesome. Giving this a B+. Next up, it's Sowing Myco Spawn, which for three generic and a green is a 3-3 Eldrazi Fungus at rare. It's got Devoid. It's got Kicker for one generic and a colorless, which means you can pay this additional cost to get some value. And when you cast it, you search your library for a land card, put it on the battlefield, and then shuffle. And when you cast it, if it was kicked, you exile target land. 
A 4-mana 3-3 that searches up a land and puts it on the battlefield is excellent, and this has the upside of also going after your opponent's mana when you can kick it. Of course, that last part doesn't matter a ton, but if you manage to get rid of, you know, a land they were playing so they could splash or something, maybe it'll actually do something. But most of the time when you're spending 6 mana on this, getting rid of your opponent's land isn't exactly going to be game-breaking. Most of the value is just about this being a 4-mana 3-3 that grabs a land, giving it a B. Next up, it's Springheart Nantuko, which for one generic and a green is a 1-1 enchantment creature. Insect Monk at rare. It's got Bestow for one generic and a green. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one. Landfall. Whenever land enters a battlefield under your control, you can pay one generic and a green if Springheart Nantuko is attached to a creature you control. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that creature. If you didn't create a token this way, create a 1-1 green insect creature token. This landfall trigger is pretty serious. Paying two mana for a copy of one of your creatures is often going to be better than whatever else you would be able to do with two mana, and getting an insect isn't terrible either. You want to make sure you play this ahead of your land drop in a turn to get value immediately. This just does a ton and has some extra synergy in the set, giving it a B+. Next up, it's Temperamental Oozewag, which for three generic and a green is a 4-4 Ooze Brushwag at common, has Adapt 2 for two generic and a green, and modified creatures you control have Trample. This will come down and give Trample to one of your creatures reasonably often, and obviously its own adaptability can grant it Trample in addition to the counter. I'm giving it a C+. Next, it's Territory Color, which for four generic and a green is a 7-5 Eldrazi at uncommon. It's got Devoid and Reach, and it has Landfall. Whenever land enters the battlefield under your control, look at the top card of your library. If it's a creature card, you may reveal it and put it into your hand. If you don't put the card into your hand, you may put it into your graveyard. This feels like it should be a rare. The stat line is a great starting point, and this landfall trigger is pretty darn strong. You're not always going to hit a creature, but it effectively lets you surveil one even when you don't hit one, and there's value in doing that too. As is usually the case with landfall, you want to play this on a turn where you can get the trigger too. I'm giving this a B+. Next up, it's Thief of Existence, which for one generic, a colorless, and a green is a 3-4 Eldrazi at rare with Devoid. When you cast this spell, exile up to one target, non-creature, non-land permanent opponent controls with mana value 4 or less. If you do, Thief of Existence gains. When this creature leaves the battlefield, target opponent draws a card. Non-creature, non-lands aren't always easy to find in Limited, but when you can hit one with this, it'll feel awesome. A lot of the time, it'll just be a vanilla creature, though, and it might kind of look like the stat line is above rate, but it's really not when you consider the demand of colorless mana. I think it's a C+. Next up, it's Trickster's Elk, which for two generic and a green is a 3-3 enchantment creature elk at uncommon. It has Bestow for one generic and a green. Enchanted creature loses all abilities and is a green elk creature with base power and toughness, 3-3. Three, three. They've got to have an Oko reference in the set, don't they? This elk is passable as a 3-mana three 3-3, three, three, and turning something else into a 3-3 three, three isn't necessarily bad either. It would be if that's all this did, but when that elk dies, you get this elk, so it's worth it. I'm giving it a B-. Next up, it's Wumpus Aberration, which for three generic and a green is a 6-6 six, six Eldrazi Beast at Uncommon. It's got Devoid. When you cast it, if Colorless wasn't spent to cast it, target opponent may put a creature card from their hand onto the battlefield, and it has Trample. Hunted Wumpus was a favorite card of mine as a kid, so getting an Eldrazi version now is pretty cool. Obviously, you really want to have colorless mana to help pay for this, or you might give your opponent a scary advantage. Chances are good that whatever they put into play isn't bigger than the Wumpus is, so it won't always be a complete disaster, but there are going to be disasters sometimes when you do this. It is worth remembering you're not actually giving them a card worth of value, you're just giving them a discount, which is much less impressive and limited, but you could still be giving them a huge advantage, and you don't want to be doing that, and I don't think having a colorless mana around by like turn four is an insane requirement. And the fact it's a 6-6 six, six Trampler, it doesn't matter if you don't necessarily have that mana earlier in the game. It's going to be a huge creature no matter when you play it. I'm giving it a C+. All right, all we have left now are the double-faced cards. The first of these is Bridgeworks Battle, which for two generic and a green is an uncommon sorcery. Target creature you control gets plus two plus two until end of turn. It fights up to one target creature you don't control. A fight isn't nearly as good as a bite since your creature does take damage, but this one offers a big enough buff that it's still pretty good. That buff can allow a wider swath of your creatures to kill a wider swath of their creatures and survive, so this will normally be a quality removal spell, one that can also be a land in a pinch. Looks pretty good, giving it a B. 
Next, it's Disciple of Freyalis, which for three generic and three green is a 3-3 three, three uncommon elf druid. When it enters the battlefield, you can sacrifice another creature. If you do, you gain X life and draw X cards, where X is that creature's power. I'm a little sad she can't sacrifice herself, but her Enter the Battlefield ability can be valuable in the right situation. But because of her high mana value, the three green mana she requires, and how situational she is inherently, she'd be a pretty rough card if this was your only option. But you'll play her as a land in the early game and then have a card with some pretty huge late game upside if you draw her late, giving her a C+. And our last green card is Grist, Voracious Larva, which for one green mana is a 1-2 legendary insect at Mythic Rare. It has Death Touch, and whenever it or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, if it entered from your graveyard or you cast it from your graveyard, you can pay one green. If you do Exile Grist, then return it to the battlefield transformed under its owner's control. Then he comes back as Grist, the Plague Swarm, a three loyalty legendary planeswalker with a plus one that makes a 1-1 one, one black and green insect creature token and mills two cards. You put a Death Touch counter on the token if a black card was milled this way. Has a minus two that destroys an artifact or enchantment and a minus six that says for each creature card in your graveyard, create a token that's a copy of it, except it's a 1-1 one, one black and green insect. A one mana 1-2 one, with Death Touch is pretty close to a C+. It can trade with anything despite only costing one, and it goes great with all the bites and fights in this set too. The bad news is transforming Grist is trickier than the others in this cycle when it comes to limited. Sure, the set has a graveyard theme of sorts, and you can do the things he asks of you, but he doesn't do anything to set up that situation for you the way the others can. The good news is he's probably the best of the double-faced planeswalkers in this set when you do transform him, since he can make a body to protect him and potentially give it death touch, and his minus two has plenty of targets, and his ultimate, if you've been using that plus one, is probably a game ender. But I do think he's hard enough to transform that he's not quite a bomb. I'm giving him a B+. All right, so now we've looked at all the cards in the main set of Modern Horizons 3. In the next video, I'll take a look at the bonus sheet. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to catch up on this set review, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching. <laughs>